When we look at the air power of the mighty Soviet Union, we have to throw away many preconceived ideas. First, the Soviet Union is not Russia, though that individual republic is the biggest part of it, just as England is the biggest part of the United Kingdom. For example, A.I. Mikoyan, who gave his name to the design bureau which produced these aircraft, was a native of another Soviet republic, Armenia. Second, there is not one, but many Soviet air forces. They include autonomous air armies, the frontal or tactical aviation, military transport aviation, all part of the main air force, the VVS. There is also naval aviation and the vast PVO, the Air Defense Forces, which comprises interception regiments and many thousands of surface-to-air missiles, more than the rest of the world combined. Maybe that is to be expected, because the Soviet Union is the world's biggest country. Right from its birth, the Soviet Union has felt itself surrounded by enemies. Indeed, from 1918, there was civil war, and the Western Allies, who had fought alongside the troops of the Tsar, tried to help the white Russian armies defeat the Reds, or the Bolsheviks. They failed. But this left the new USSR with the belief that the allies of old Russia were the enemies of the Soviet Union. Indeed, Lenin proclaimed that the capitalist countries would forever try to destroy this pioneer communist state. It is a belief that has been taught in Soviet schools ever since, and is emphasized by the fact that the state has always maintained huge armed forces. By the 1930s, the Soviet Union was eager to show the achievements of nationwide centralized planning. It wanted to think big, and it was proud of the ANT-20 Maxim Gorky, largest aircraft in the world, which was the flagship of a propaganda squadron, and often flew escorted by I-5 fighters to show its huge size. But the rise of Nazi Germany in the 1930s threatened the fledgling Soviet state. And the Red Army, already weakened by terrible internal divisions and purges, which had removed many of its key officers, was not ready to repel an invasion. On the 22nd of June, 1941, Hitler unleashed five million troops in 190 divisions against the USSR. The resulting conflict saw vast tracts of the Soviet Union ravaged and under fascist control. This was known by the Soviets as the Great Patriotic War. The Luftwaffe was ordered to destroy the cities. To defend their motherland, thousands of young men and women from all over the Soviet Union joined the Air Defense Group, which included barrage balloons, anti-aircraft guns and fighters. The battle for control of the air over the cities was long and hard. The most numerous fighters were the Yaks, of which over 37,000 were built, more than any other type of fighter in history, despite the fact that in September and October 1941, to avoid being bombed, the entire production had to be moved far to the east, often to places where there were no railways and only dirt roads. But there was never a shortage, either of fighters or of pilots, and no fewer than 93 members of the Air Defense Group were invested as heroes of the Soviet Union, an honor never bestowed lightly. These BF-110s, BF-109s, and FW-190s were among the more than 7,300 fascist aircraft confirmed as destroyed by the Air Defense Group, whose equipment was swelled by large numbers of American Air Cobras and British Hurricanes. The tide began to turn in favor of the Soviet Union. A lasting bond of friendship was formed with France, whose pilots formed a special unit, the Normandie Neiman Regiment. With a score of 237 confirmed victories, it was by far the top scoring French unit of World War II. And, symbolically, one of its members will remain on the strength of today's all-Soviet unit forever. Many thousands of families in the Soviet Union have seen fathers, sons, and even grandsons serve in the defense of the motherland. In the Great Patriotic War, David Yuchuk flew no fewer than 820 combat missions. 
mostly in SB-2 bombers. Not many details have filtered through to the outside world about the massive Soviet bomber campaign using SB-2s, IL-4s, TU-2s and other types which put down more bombs on the fascist heartlands than the combined weight of the RAF and US Army Air Forces. No Air Force in the world has a greater sense of history than that of the VVS, the Central Air Force of the Soviet Union. Virtually every cadet visits the Air Force's museum at Monino to see the actual Lavochkins, Yaks and MiGs that drove off the invaders. After graduating from high school, thousands of cadets each year start along the long road that leads to being a Soviet combat pilot. Right at the start, remotely piloted model airplanes are used to instill a feeling for air combat and a sense of how to achieve a dominant tactical position. This is something ignored in the West. These youngsters plan to go on to a military air school where they will be instructed and monitored by political officers. Western Air Force air crew know nothing of instruction along the lines of patriotism and political dogma, but in the Soviet Union it is all important. Also important is the use of gliders. Here at the Venitsa Aero Club in the Ukraine, Czech-built Blanik tandem seat training gliders are used as the first step in the flying training course. This young man is the third generation of his family to look ahead to a career in the Soviet Air Force. Most pilots do training on gliders at their nearest aero club. Many then go on to a very demanding aerobatic training on such agile aircraft as the Su-26 or Yak-55 and the Yak-53, here practicing in formation, probably the best aerobatic trainers in the world. With such practical flight training behind them, the cadets feel ready to face the tough course at an Air Force Flight Academy. Here they are cut down to size and reminded that every mission starts from the ground and must be properly planned and the political training is intensified. Before they ever get into a cockpit they further polish their skills in repeated sessions on electronic simulators. Experienced frontline commanders and political workers pass on their knowledge to the cadets during every waking hour. After weeks of training, at last comes the thrill of the first flight. The standard jet trainers are built in Czechoslovakia, the L-29 Delphi, seen here, and the L-39 Albatross. Both are tough, all-metal aircraft, much more advanced than anything the cadet has seen before. From his front cockpit, he can see all that happens. But on the first flight, he is little more than a passenger. No mask need be worn, and he comes along for the ride as the experienced backseat instructors demonstrate a complete mission. Included is flying in loose formation. Over the coming months, each cadet becomes not just able to fly, but totally at home under the most demanding circumstances. At last comes the great day of graduation, when all the fortunate cadets pass out as fully qualified Soviet pilots, ready for posting to a combat training unit. First comes a combat training regiment, of the kind known in the West as a combat crew training wing, or operational conversion unit. Here the eager fledglings make the acquaintance of the MiG-21. This tailed Delta Wing fighter serves with more air forces than any other airplane. Those used for training are unpainted, but in every other respect they have the full capabilities of those in combat units.
After honing their flying skills and familiarizing themselves with a the partial pressure flying suit and helmet, the course continues. Each pilot is already practiced in formation flying, but now he has a lot more power and performance, right up to Mach 2. Each mission flown provides extra knowledge and experience in the handling of fast jet fighters and fosters good cooperation. Eventually, at the end of the course, the successful pilots are ready for their first assignment to an operational unit of the gigantic force called Frontal Aviation, where most aircraft are painted in various low visibility colors. This MiG-21 gate guardian commemorates a Soviet pilot who rammed his aircraft into an intruding plane. Beyond the gate is a frontal aviation base in the giant region of Siberia in the Far East. One of its officers is Anatoly Yuchuk younger son of wartime bomber pilot David. Anatoly Yachuk's regiment is equipped with the MiG-21 BIS, many thousands of which have been built for the Soviet frontal air forces. Carrying on where his father left off, Anatoly teaches his pilots how to navigate and how to win in air combat. Frequent flights are made with pairs of aircraft, usually carrying UV-1657 unguided rocket pods. Pilots are instructed on how to attack ground targets with unguided rockets and also with the twin 23mm internal cannon. In the air combat role, the MiG-21s often fire the K-13A missile, which homes by sensing the infrared emissions from the target's tailpipe. The CO from the Far Eastern Republics gives a lesson in interception tactics and the absolute need to be master of one's aircraft. Using a model of the swing wing MiG-23, he explains the next task set his pupils. They will climb to 5,000 meters and fly at 600 kilometers per hour before, on command, performing a half roll followed by a half loop back to level flight.
Whenever possible, pupils walk through the entire mission on a plot marked out on the airfield, each student representing the relative position of his aircraft. Then, the big hangar doors are opened, and pupils and instructors taxi out in their MiG-23U trainers. Each capable of over Mach 2, the MiG-23U is one of the most common combat trainers of Soviet frontal aviation. They take off in pairs, down a runway whose size matches the vastness of the country. Climbing for altitude, Pupils and instructors know that on this mission, they need not wear oxygen masks. They are going to practice the interception of hostile aircraft at medium altitude. Nothing very demanding, but to the inexperienced pilot, the sheer power and complexity of the aircraft poses a real challenge. Now, in the far west of the Soviet Union, more than 5,000 miles away from his younger brother, we find a frontline regiment of frontal aviation commanded by Viktor Yuchuk. Armed with the UV-1657 and UV-3257 rocket launcher, their aircraft is another version of the MiG-23, the 23MF. The aircraft's GSH-23L twin-barrel cannon are serviced and armed before each mission. In the locker room, the pilots dress for action. Today, their ordnance will include the simple K-13A air-to-air -air missile with an infrared homing head. As usual, Viktor Yuchuk will lead the aircraft detailed for this practice mission. Between them, the aircraft will carry several hundreds of the 57 millimeter rockets, which can be fired in any kind of weather, day or night. Was important, and the tower quickly gives clearance for successive takeoffs using full afterburn. More aircraft of this type are serving in frontline regiments than any other combat aircraft in the world. The CO and his wingman head for the designated combat zone in aircraft 46 and 55. Each is able to reach Mach 1.2 at sea level, a speed not exceeded by any other aircraft in service anywhere. Some NATO critics have suggested that the MiG cannot maneuver very well. They have likened it to a juggernaut truck or a super tanker. It should be remembered, however, that the Soviet Union does not have a reputation for mass producing anything that does not do its job. To suggest otherwise is simply to fly in the face of history. Even at low level, these frontline pilots always wear oxygen masks. Arriving over the target, Yuchuk and his men roll over into dive attacks and, taking careful aim, ripple away their salvos of supersonic rockets. Frontal aviation probably gets through more rockets in a year than the rest of the world's air forces combined. Some of the aircraft are carrying bombs and others cluster dispensers. Guided by radars, the MiGs head for home. Half an hour later, the landing gears extend and they land in a stream, braked by their drag ships.
Every Soviet airbase, even in frontal aviation, is on the grand scale. Runways are seldom less than three kilometers long, or 10,000 feet. But air defense is strictly the task of the PVO, an enormous specialist organization and not part of the VVS. Nodding Heightfinder radars stand guard 24 hours a day, every day of the year. All round the endless frontier of the Soviet Union, tens of thousands of radars of 18 types keep watch for hostile aircraft or missiles. Among them are the biggest and most powerful radars in the world. Small surveillance and target tracking radars are used in great numbers by the PVO-ZR, Zenith rockets or surface-to-air missile troops. All PVO forces in each area are controlled from hardened command centers where all sensors and defensive forces are coordinated. Every day, hundreds of target engagement and tracking radars are put on alert. The troops respond instantly. For all they know, it is not an exercise, but a real attack. Launch crews dash down into hardened bunkers to prepare and control launch facilities for the world's most common surface-to-air missile, the V-750 series, over 100,000 of which were built years ago. Many of these large but aging weapons are at readiness on fixed sites. Several thousand of V-750s are brought up on trucks as reloads. Often they travel a long way, through rough territory, and the exercise serves to polish every man's performance and cut precious seconds off the time to get into action. Each week, several thousand new men, almost all of them doing their conscript period of service, are trained in the complex duties of manning PVO-ZR missile sites. Always the newcomers are helped so that each unit's performance will stay on the top line. Sometimes, by day or night, missiles are actually fired. There is no shortage but each shot is aimed at an actual remotely piloted target. Every launch crew hears the story of the American Francis Gary Powers, who on the 1st of May 1960 flew right across the southern republics of the Soviet Union before being engaged and shot down by a V-750 battery near the city of Sverdlovsk. This was one exercise that was very much for real, and the performance was 100%. The troops are constantly reminded that they are charged with defending their native land. To do it, as the book says, with dignity and honor, they can call on more than 10,000 air defense radars and many more SAM missiles than there are in the rest of the world. Except for the giant space and anti-missile systems, every SAM missile and its sensing and aiming systems is fully mobile, and most can even swim rivers and keep up with the fastest army vehicles. Unlike the NATO nations, the Soviet Union has a specialized military air transport force, the VTA. One of its chief types is the tremendously capable Ilyushin 76MB. 
powered by four D30 KP1 turbofan engines, each fitted with a thrust reverser, the IL-76 can operate from short rough airstrips with a full payload of 48 metric tons, or 53 short tons. Anyone who flies the 76 feels he can truck anything, anywhere, at any time, and the VTA trains its crews to feel like this. A recently qualified pilot makes his first trip on the flight deck of a 76 belonging to a VTA unit, which has received many state awards for its proficiency. His first indoctrination flight is quite short, and under control from the tower, the 76MD returns to its runway and briefly uses reverse thrust. There are many of these aircraft at the base, and now it is time for a combined arms exercise. Various loads go aboard, including ASU-85 assault guns and BMD light armored carriers. At the tail of each aircraft are multiple 23mm cannons, to provide radar-directed firepower against any hostile fighters. The crews of the big Aleutians are kept on the top line. Some aircraft have on board 125 highly trained parachute troops. Others have armored vehicles, artillery, and other heavy loads, all tasked to capture and hold objectives on the ground. If they can make a landing, then they can evacuate sick and wounded, no matter what the weather or enemy might do. Setting forth at a steady 750 kilometers per hour, the new member of the regiment is making his first combat mission in the role of co-pilot. The paratroops settle in for a long flight. Below the cockpit, another crew member, the dispatcher, pinpoints the landing zone through radar and the downward-looking observation windows and gives the green light signal for the airdrop. First go the heavy loads, including the armored vehicles. As each load reaches the ground, its fall is suddenly slowed by powerful retro rockets which soften the landing. Then come the troops with their equipment. In seconds, they fill the sky. A few more seconds, and they have taken possession of the enemy territory. Within minutes, a mobile armored force with formidable firepower is assembled on the ground and begins advancing. While the airborne forces advance, the big Aleutians are landing back at their airfield, and in a real campaign, they would pick up a second load. If the paratroops could capture an airfield intact, then the big transports could offload their armored vehicles direct down the rear ramp and move into action. Though a most capable aircraft, 
The IL-76 looks like a minnow beside the whale-like Antonov 124 Ruslan. In most respects, the AN-124 is the biggest aircraft in the world, and British crowds were glad to welcome it to the 1988 Farnborough Air Show. Powered by four Lotariff D-18T turbofan engines, each fitted with a thrust reverser, the AN-124 has a wingspan of 73.3 meters, or well over 240 feet. Inside the wing is room for 230 metric tons of fuel, some 60 to 70 tons more than the limit for a 747 jumbo. Yet the wing looks quite small against the mammoth fuselage. Maximum takeoff weight is 405 metric tons, or 450 US tons, a greater weight than ever before lifted into the sky. Yet the 24 wheels spread the load so well that this giant can use unpaved airstrips, which makes it an ideal heavy lifter, not only for the military VTA, but also for Aeroflot in opening up the untapped resources of Siberia. In July 1985, an AN-124 lifted a payload of over 171 metric tons to a height of 10,750 meters, 35,269 feet. This exceeded by 53% the previous record, set by a USAF galaxy, which reached a height of only 2,000 meters, or 6,500 feet. In May 1987, Another Ruslan set a new closed-circuit distance record, flying round a large part of the Soviet Union, a distance of 20,151 kilometers, well over 12,500 miles, in 25 and a half hours. To load bulky items, both the tail doors and the nose can be opened. The hydraulic drive takes seven minutes to open the nose fully, to above the flight deck. This then gives clear access to an interior wider than a jumbo jet and almost twice as high from floor to ceiling. This Ruslan is civilian, but the VTA version can carry virtually any mobile vehicle or other load in the entire Soviet inventory, including giant radars or two main battle tanks or the SS-20 and SS-25 mobile long-range nuclear missiles, complete on their transporter vehicles. These mobile missile systems, which cover most of the Northern Hemisphere, can be relocated by an AN-124 anywhere in the Soviet Union in a few hours. One of the Soviet aircraft industry's greatest achievements was the Tupolev Tu-95, first flown in 1954. Called Bear by NATO, this amazing aircraft is powered by four huge 15,000 horsepower turboprops. By driving eight-blade contra-rotating propellers with their giant blades set at an extremely coarse angle, this aircraft was able to combine the fuel economy of propellers with the speed of a jet. It was a fantastic achievement, and nobody was heard the deep rumbling sound of these aircraft, which echoes from miles around the airfield circuit, can fail to think that they are something else. Even more remarkable, different versions have been in production for 35 years. These noble aircraft have been identified in major versions, some of which have themselves been seen in up to four different subversions. Originally designed as a high altitude strategic bomber, the Tu 95 and today's Tu 142 now rumble their distinctive way over most of the Northern Hemisphere. It is doubtful if any other warplane in history has been able to claim an unrefueled combat radius of 8,285 kilometers. Note, this is the radius of action, the range being more than double this distance. Such aircraft have enabled the Soviet Union to take its place as one of the world's two superpowers, replacing Great Britain as a nation able to deploy military power around the globe.
Two of the commoner versions, which range far into the world's ocean areas, are the Bear D Maritime Reconnaissance with a giant belly radar and the TU-142 Bear H cruise missile carrier, which has a new airframe and totally different equipment. Sometimes Bear Ds are intercepted by F-15s of the USAF 21st Tactical Fighter Wing of Alaska Air Command, operating out of Elmdorf Air Force Base. The VMF, the Soviet Navy, plays a central role in this widening of horizons. Its size and influence have grown immensely over the last 20 years. As a projection of power, the carrier Kiev and her three sister ships have the Yak-38 V-Stall combat aircraft. In service for 13 years, this jet-lift aircraft can carry gun or rocket pods, bombs or air-to-air -air or air-to-ship missiles. It is part of a mighty Navy buildup under the great Admiral Gorshkov and continued under Admiral Chernavi. The VMF ships have more firepower of more varied types than the world has ever seen before. Every major unit bristles with radars, electronic warfare devices, guns, rockets, and missiles of all kinds. The best route into a frontline squadron of the VVS is to graduate from the Gagarin Academy, where technical and political training is thorough graduates could not imagine anything more exciting than going on to convert to the fastest fighter in the world, the massive MiG-25. To do this, they are instructed on the dual control MiG-25U. On the very first indoctrination mission, they may well climb to a height of 25 kilometers, 82,000 feet, where the sky is dark violet. They could feel remote, were it not for the fact that at Mach 3, Things happen very fast. The second cockpit replaces the interceptor's huge radar, but the trainer still has four large missile pylons and the continuous wave target illuminating pods on the wingtips. After completing the MiG-25 course, the pilots who are good enough are posted to a combat regiment equipped with the MiG-25 interceptor. Even carrying four of the biggest air-to-air -air missiles in the world, the colossal combined thrust of two R-31 engines fires the 37-ton fighter down the runway like a bullet from a gun. On a practice interception, each of the section of four aircraft carries two radar-guided missiles and two with infrared homing. Even with this load, the MiG-25 can intercept an intruder at up to 1,450 kilometers, 900 miles from its base, and then return. The most numerous aircraft in today's frontal aviation is the MiG-27. The MiG-27 is a close relative of the MiG-23 fighter, but with a totally different front end and an engine installation designed for air-to-ground missions at low level. The MiG-27 is a tough, well-equipped and popular aircraft, and the temporary CO of this tactical unit, Viktor Salnikov, 
enjoys leading his men. Here they are going on a training mission at dusk. The R-29-300 engine gives tremendous performance at low level, combined with rugged reliability, and the different versions of this aircraft are fully equipped to find surface targets and survive enemy air defenses. Today, the Mikoyan Design Bureau has gone far beyond the MiG-27. Well over 500 frontal aviation pilots have qualified on this trainer, the MiG-29UB. A totally new design, first flown in 1977, the MiG-29 entered service in 1983, and yet in some important respects is much more advanced than the prototypes of new Western fighters, which will not be in service in numbers until the mid-1990s or later. The nose of the UB two-seat conversion trainer houses a smaller radar than the single-seat fighter version. A lightweight 30 mm cannon is mounted in the left hand wing route and is used in conjunction with a laser rangefinder. To the rear are two electronic warfare protection antennas which look ahead from the leading edge. The solid fuselage construction is obvious. The Mikoyan Design Bureau badge is proudly displayed on the engine intakes behind the substantial nose wheel undercarriage. The main undercarriage is also substantial to allow for operation from rough airstrips. The front undercarriage retracts backwards, while the main gear retracts forwards, the wheels lying flat in the wing. An unusual feature of the MiG-29 is that on most interceptions, to avoid being detected, the pilot does not use his radar at all. Above the nose is a large infrared search and track glass ball, through which looks the most sensitive passive infrared detector ever fitted to a fighter. In the trainer, the instructor sits in the rear seat and uses a periscope during nose-up landings. Behind the advanced ejection seats are video recorders used on each mission. When these MiGs arrived at the 1988 Farnborough Air Show, everyone expected them to put on an exciting flying display. But in the crucial matter of avionics and fire control systems, it was taken for granted that Soviet technology was years behind the West's. American experts told the world that the MiG-29's advanced look-down, shoot-down pulse Doppler radar was made possible only by stealing the secrets of the radar fitted to the American Hornet. It was therefore a shattering surprise to find that the MiG-29A has a radar which in almost every respect outperforms that of the Hornet and which, when coupled with the infrared search and track ball, provides unrivaled ability. And even more, everything is presented to the pilot neatly on a helmet-mounted sight, which tells him everything he needs to know in a way that NATO pilots are unlikely to enjoy until at least 10 years after the MiG-29 entered service.
In the MiG-29A, the fin root extensions, which look like fences, house flare and shaft dispensers, which are, however, not fitted to the MiG-29UB. Power is provided in both the trainer and single-seater by a pair of Tumansky R33D engines. The braking parachute is housed between the two jet pipes, which are unshielded from infrared emissions. On takeoff and landing, the huge air inlets to the MiG-29's R33D engines are shut off to avoid ingesting slush, stones or water, the air being sucked in from above. Despite this, the MiG-29A has the amazingly short combat takeoff run of 240 meters or 790 feet. The pilot can then pull straight up into a vertical climb with the unrivaled climb rate of 330 meters per second or 65,000 feet per minute. At Farnborough, however, one of the surprises was to stop the MiG in mid-air and then let it fall back in a tail slide. MiG pilots have found that by hovering motionless, they can confuse enemy radars, which rely on Doppler effects caused by the motion of the target. The MiG-29A can be loaded with six air-to-air -air missiles of a completely new and deadly design, again carried in a mix of radar and infrared versions. It also has the lightest 30mm gun in the world, and thanks to the world-beating accuracy of the infrared and laser systems, it virtually never misses. The MiG Deputy General Designer said, had we known that every round would hit the target, we would have halved the ammunition capacity. Of course, like all Soviet tactical aircraft, the MiG-29A has extremely comprehensive electronic warfare systems. Throughout each MiG-29 flight, it was obvious to the Farnborough crowds that the MiG pilots were completely happy, even in seemingly impossible attitudes and at speeds below 100 knots. They said, we just hate having to land. Back in July 1986, a special detachment of six MiG-29As of an earlier subtype flew from Kubinka Air Base near Moscow to an airfield in Finland. This goodwill visit gave Western observers their first close-up view of a modern Soviet combat aircraft, though in 1986 even the MiG-29 had already been flying for nine years. interesting display was put on by a Singleton aircraft. This was followed by a pleasant show by four of the fighters flying formation aerobatics.
At the time, it was not really appreciated how restrained this display was, giving not the slightest hint of the MiG-29's superb strength, agility, and surplus of engine thrust. Today, in fact, we realize that a MiG-29 could actually put on a very impressive display with a ratio of thrust to weight of roughly unity, with one engine shut down. From modest beginnings, the Soviet helicopter designers today rank second to none. The Mill Bureau produced a helicopter in 1956, which dwarfed all others. Even this one, the MI-8, is bigger and more powerful than its western counterpart, the Sea King. And despite its impressive capability, which includes an internal payload of over 8,800 pounds, it has been built in fantastic numbers, exceeding 10,000. Vehicles can drive in through rear doors, but here, loads of 24 armed troops are being inserted in an exercise. MI-8 helicopters have been exported to at least 40 countries, including Finland. Large numbers of MI-8s played a central role in Afghanistan. There, hundreds have been deployed, serving with both Soviet and Afghan government forces, often around the clock. They were, however, increasingly likely to encounter fire from the Mujahideen. To try to crush all resistance, the heavily armed MI-24 was also used in Afghanistan. This big gunship helicopter can fly attack, anti-tank, troop transport, electronic warfare, and special reconnaissance missions. An indication of the performance of the MI-24 was given by a world speed record of 229 miles per hour in 1978. During army exercises, the Soviets use MI-24s and fixed-wing attack aircraft in conjunction with rapidly moving ground forces, frequently equipped with light armor to break through the enemy's defenses. MI-24s are also used in the anti-tank role. They are also often used to support river crossings and the seizure of strategic objectives. The use of attack helicopters coupled with an armored thrust can be devastating.
In the real war in Afghanistan, however, things were tougher, and convoys of trucks often brought back shot-down helicopters and even IL-28 jet bombers. Like the MI-8, the MI-24 gunship was deployed to Afghanistan in large numbers. One of the few anti-aircraft weapons available to the Mujahideen was the small Stinger missile. To counter this weapon's infrared homing head, the Soviet aircraft used to release bright flares, the standard infrared countermeasure. On the other hand, Stinger itself gained a reputation for unreliability. Here, an MI-24 gunship flies over a Stinger well within range, but the missile failed to lock on to the target. To help support the beleaguered Sandinista government in Nicaragua, the Soviet Union supplied 30 large helicopters in 1986, including six of these Hind Ds. They are fully equipped with all the electronics needed for night and bad weather operations and are the only machines of their type in the Western Hemisphere. They have been used mainly for the tactical support of the troop-carrying helicopters, but can themselves carry troops in the rear cabin. Like all Soviet equipment, the Mi-24 is tough and designed to survive in harsh environments. Many Western observers have scorned Soviet design as being crude and backward. But each Soviet weapon is the end product of a very carefully considered design process, whose inputs are harsher and more demanding than those in the West.